Father in heaven, it's a privilege to come in your presence on this, your holy Sabbath day of rest. You have been with us in the past, and we believe your presence is here with us. We desire revival and reformation today. We desire a refreshing. Bless us now, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessed Sabbath to those of you who are joining us for this Sabbath service here, uh, July 11th, 2020. Welcome one, Save to Serve International and first time viewers. As we go throughout this message, this Bible study, I know certainly I'm not going to be able to complete all the various points. So by God's grace, I'm going to return for a part two. Beloved, we're living in a time where people's hearts are failing them for fear. Luke 21, verse 25, and verse number 26 confirms. And the Bible says, while men's hearts are failing them for fear, that his faithful people in these last days should be looking up, lifting up their heads. Why? Their redemption draweth nigh. And as you go throughout this message, I want to focus your, your attention on God's promises. Psalm 27, the Bible says in verse number one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? No fear, my friends. Psalm 23, the Bible says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what, friends? I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. All these promises. So why is it that God's people are in the spirit of trepidation. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. These are promises I yours truly, cling to in these times of crises as you're going through sicknesses, going through fiery trials, financial crises, going through even bereavement, holding on to these promises. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For I have not given to you the spirit of fear, but of what? Love, love power, and a sound mind. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. For fear brings torment. Perfect love casteth out all fear. Fear brings torment. But those who have the love of God abiding in their hearts, they triumph over fear. Fear makes people miserable. In these last days. And closing, Psalm 46 and verse number one, a beautiful one I love, which says, God is a refuge. God is our what? Strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Verse two, therefore shall we not fear. Powerful scriptures, my friends, to hold on to, to strengthen our faith in these last days. And we're told as I transition in the book Life Sketches, page 196, that we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way how the Lord has led, led, and his teachings in our past history. Friends, if we don't study history, we won't comprehend what is happening presently. And with that in mind, let's turn our attention now to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse number 9, 
which augments Life Sketches, page 196. The Bible says there's no new thing under the sun. The things that were, those things shall be. The things that have been done, those things shall be done. And there's no new thing, the Bible says, under the sun. Friends, there are many things I am certain of in these last days. And one of those things I am certain of is that just before the second coming of Jesus Christ, the mark of the beast will be enforced. And that is uh, Revelation chapter 14 and verse number 9 through verse number 16. I am certain of that. And secondly, I know that the mark of the beast, Sunday rest by law, will be enforced first in the United States of America, and then it goes globally. An international, universal Sunday law. And we know that there are many factors that will lead to the enforcement of a national Sunday law. And one of those factors is an economic meltdown, a financial crash. A Sunday law is coming to return to prosperity, temporal prosperity, great controversy. Page 590 confirms that. To return to temporal prosperity. And Laudato Si also confirms Sunday rest by law. For the poor to care for nature. And friends, I want to say this. We emphasize and we over amplify the coming mark of the beast crisis. Why? Because that is the signal event that shows the close of human probation takes place officially, individually, and then for the whole entire world. It's time now to give a clarion, the clarion call for God's people to begin to have deep self-examination, heart biblical conversion. And it's time for practical preparation to meet that ominous event and to get others ready as we perform the work of aggressive and effective evangelism for Jesus Christ. Since a Sunday law, note this point, since a Sunday law is coming to return to temporal prosperity, then what must happen to prosperity in America and around the world? Prosperity has to decline significantly. We must find a severe economic meltdown, economic crash. And friends, there are many things that can bring this economic crash. Do you know the Bible shows them to us in Matthew 24? In verse 6 to verse number 8, wars. Can a war, can wars bring an economic meltdown? Yes. What about racial tensions, shutting down marketplaces, businesses? Oh, yes. What about pestilences? What's happening since COVID-19? Calamities, climate change. Look at the screen. I'm telling you, July 10th. 2020, World Health Organization says countries, that's plural, countries may have to return to total lockdown after cases double worldwide in less than six weeks. Total lockdown. An economic crisis. A Sunday law is coming to return to temporal prosperity. Now, friends, which class of other classes in America, around the world, will demand a Sunday law in order to return to prosperity? The rich or the poorer class? Which one? 
because from the middle class will utterly be decimated. Which of those two classes? The rich, the 2%, or the poor, the 98%? It's the poorer class. It's the poorer class of individuals that are working 24-7 cycle just to make ends meet, to be able to provide. In an economic meltdown, the rich have a nest egg. They have a buffer, but not the poor. The poor will cry for a son the law more than the rich. And that's what we are told, my friends. Watch carefully. In Great Controversy, page 592, that it is the people that will cry for a son the law. Who, my friends? The people. And this is what we find in Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. And verse 15, it's the people that will demand a son the law. Which group of people? Not the rich per se, primarily. It is the poorer class. And friends, the poorer class in America, which system of economy do they favor? Capitalism or socialism? Which one? Let me ask again. Which system of economy, finances, do the poor support now in America? In which direction are they trending? It's not capitalism. They view capitalism as a part of their problem. Capitalism, they say, is oppressive. And the, 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 the trajectory is pointing toward socialism. Look at, so in other words, in other words, for a Sunday law to be enforced, the ingredient of socialism must be present. Look at this, my friends. It says, in their own words, behind Americans' views of socialism and capitalism, it says 55% of Americans had a negative impression of socialism. While 42% express a positive view. Let that sink in, friends. And that was in 2019. What is that percentage today? July 11th, 2020. Socialism, as popular as capitalism among young adults in America. For many young people, socialism is as American as apple pie, if you want a slice of the proverbial pie, you can't look towards capitalism, look to socialism as the savior. Friends, you watch this point. Here's my golden theme. All throughout prophecy, we focus on the two beasts of Revelation 13. Who are these two beasts? The leopard-like beast, verse 1 to verse 10, the papacy. The lamb-like beast that will speak as a dragon, verse 11 to verse 18, apostate, protestant America. Two beasts, and for the most part, many have overlooked the third beast. Where's that third beast? It's in Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, verse 8. Verse 9, Egypt, atheism, sodomy, licentiousness, that beast from the bottomless pit. And all throughout this message, I'm going to share with you to beware. Beware of the trinity of beasts. The trinity of beasts. All three beasts. And let me tell you something. It's the beast from the bottomless pit. From Revelation chapter 11, that is the matchmaker. It's the what, friends? It's the matchmaker for those two beasts of Revelation chapter 13. The papacy, an apostate Protestant America, the trinity of beasts, beware. Back to the screen. Socialism. And socialism is found in the third beast. 
in Revelation chapter 11, verse 7 through verse 8. Look at the screen. Why democratic socialism appeals to whom? What group? To millennials. What demographic of people more so are marching in the streets right now as I speak? It's not Generation X. It's not the silent generation. It's not the boomers. No, it's the millennials. Primarily the largest class. Also, Gen Z, Generation Z. Watch. All right, friends, notice millennials support socialism because they want to make America great, but make America great for everyone. Socialism. 2020, that article, friends. Now, notice again. Write this point and don't you miss it. In order for a Sunday law to be enforced, Starting in America, the ingredient of socialism must be in that mixture. Notice now, what is Pope Francis supporting and promoting? It's socialism on the screen. Pope Francis says, socialist agenda. Catholics are saying this. Red words like Bernie Sanders, the Pope is a socialist. They're even saying he's worse than Bernie Sanders. Socialist Pope. And they mentioned when the Pope said capitalism is the dung of the devil. Since capitalism is the filth of the devil, that means socialism is what? What is the opposite of dung? <laughs> Don't let me go there, friends. Notice. He says, unbridled capitalism is the dung of the devil. So what is the Pope promoting? Socialism. By the way, note this. Popery says that there is a war between capitalism and the Sunday Sabbath. And if we have capitalism, then the Sunday Sabbath will be suppressed. What we want is socialism, and then we can have Sunday Sabbath. Look at this, my friends. Watch carefully. Capitalism's war on the Sabbath. And what Sabbath are they talking about? The false Sabbath. The counterfeit Sabbath. Blue words. It is Sunday. Sunday for God. Sunday for the people. Get rid of capitalism. Look at this now. And the papacy. Papi says, uh, when capitalism came to Poland, all of a sudden, Sunday shopping began. So if you remove capitalism, what do you have? Uh, Sunday shopping, ban. Sunday worship by law. Sunday rest by law. Again I say, for a Sunday law to become, the law of the land, the ingredient of socialism must be in that mixture. Hold on. Let me give you a history. I just quoted earlier from Life Sketches, page 196. We have nothing to fear for the future except that we forget the way how God led and his teachings in our past history. Watch this. When the Sunday bill was being proposed in the U.S. Congress by Senator Blair and others, we are told from A.T. Jones, church historian, that connected with Senator Blair, Sunday bill was the ingredient of socialism. And since it was then, so it will be. Are you ready for this now? Watch. There it is, my friends. Blue words. And the principle upon which Dr. Crafts, says A.T. Jones, and his other Sunday Law colleagues gained the support of the working men to the Blair Sunday Bill is nothing at all but the principle of downright socialism. 
That's one reference. A second reference. 1886. A.T. Jones is quoting now. He says, uh, says the union, quote, a strong and apparently, blue words, a strong and apparently hopeful attempt is being made to secure the enforcement by law of Sunday observance, not on religious grounds, but on socialistic grounds. Ooh. Let that sink in. And then the union most meaningly says it is very clear that if our Sabbath, of course, that's A.T. Jones' words in brackets, that if, if our Sunday is to be preserved at all and we are sanguine, which means optimistic, we are optimistic of its preservation. Watch this. The non-religious sentiment of the country must be brought in, mercy, to reinforce the religious demand for Sunday rest. And it is increasingly evident that this is entirely practicable. And curiously, what renders this practicable is that horrid socialism, mercy, which keeps some good people lying awake all, all night in fear of trembling. Do you catch it, my friends? When Sunday was coming, they said, we want Sunday law to occur. Not on religious grounds at first, oh no, but on socialistic grounds. Is there a movement of socialism rife in America right now? Is a Sunday law near? But you wouldn't see it. You could not discern it until you look at history. Look at this, friends. A third witness. 1887. On top, the truth of the matter is that there is no use, says A.T. Jones, in trying to dodge it, that all these so-called what movements? Labor movements are, in the last analysis, what, friends? Socialism. Then he says, and socialism, in the last analysis, is what? Is anarchism. Powerful statement. So what two words did A.T. Jones use synonymously? Socialism, anarchism. Second paragraph, again, 1887. How many references do you need? A fourth one. He says, the country, America, is in danger. From these what, my friends? From these terrible socialistic revolutions. And to save themselves and the country, from what danger? The danger of socialism. I want to ask you a question, friends. So what was rife in America leading up to the almost enforced Sunday bill in 1888? A terrible socialistic revolution. All right. Since history shall be repeated, what is rife in America right now and around the world right now? A terrible socialistic revolution. Look at the screen. So A.T. Jones used the word anarchism in lieu of socialism. Do you remember what Sister White said in the book Education, page 228? Here it is, my friends. Just one sentence, the first sentence. At the same time, what? What is anarchy now? Socialism. At the same time, socialism. Anarchy is seeking to sweep away what, my friends? All law, not only divine, but also human law. So what was A.T. Jones saying? In 1888, he says uh, that socialism, anarchism, was about to sweep away human laws and to bring us Sunday law. Do you see it now? And what says Sister White right here? She says uh, anarchy will sweep away. Not only 
human oppressive laws. Oh no. But also divine law. Again I say. That is Sunday. Rest thy law. Again I reiterate. For a Sunday law to be enforced in America. Then it goes globally. The ingredient of socialism. The ingredient of socialism as a matchmaker, as a bonding slime, as glue must be in the mixture. If that's clear, my friends, just say amen. Now notice, notice here, my friends. A.T. Jones goes on to say, I want everyone to watch this point. A.T. Jones said, a part of the socialistic revolution Leading up to the Sunday Law Bill in 1888 was this. The socialists were promoting universal basic income. Have you heard that today? Guaranteed income? Even for folks who don't work? Look at the screen here, my friends. Watch. I, I gave you this reference earlier. Let's read all of it. He says, Why shall not the government, both state and national, take possession of everything and pay the laboring men full wages of all the time for doing nothing? Is that not socialism? When the government controls everything? It says, red words, If a man is entitled to wages, for doing nothing part of the time. Well, he's entitled, says A.T. Jones, to wages for doing nothing all the time. What is that, my friends? Guaranteed basic income and the principle upon which Dr. Crafts and his other Sunday Law colleagues gain the support of the working men. So the Blair Sunday Bill is nothing at all but the principle of what, my friends? Downright socialism. Guaranteed basic income. Universal basic income was connected to, to the Sunday Bill in 1888 or the Sunday Law Movement in 1888. A universal basic income will lead to a national and a universal Sunday law. It's the matchmaker, socialism. Look at the screen here, friends. There it is. 2020. And COVID-19 set the stage. Congress is now debating to enforce creating a basic income. Pass that. This is July 11th. That was yesterday, uh, this was today. Look at that. July, June 11th, rather, 2020. Headline says, is universal basic income the next new deal? Look at this. And as I was doing some research, I came across the fact that Thomas Paine, do you know who Thomas Paine was? Thomas Paine championed Universal basic income, look at the screen. Stanford education, ancestors of universal basic income were discussed by the likes of Thomas Paine. Do you know Thomas Paine lived in what time? 1790s, the French Revolution. Socialism, my friends. The beast from the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter 11. Verse 7, verse 8, look at the screen. Also, blue words. In the form of a lump sum granted to all citizens, all citizens at adulthood. In a context of systemic discrimination against African Americans and the resulting widespread of unemployment and poverty, who else championed? Universal basic income, Martin Luther King Jr., the Black Panther 
party. James Boggs, also considered guaranteed income. Thomas Paine, socialism. Thomas Paine, destroying faith in the word of God. What does Sister White say about Thomas Paine? All right, look at this red word. She says, Thomas Paine has passed into his grave, but his works live to curse, to curse the world. And what did Thomas Paine support and promote? Universal. Basic income, socialism is a curse, my friends. Now watch. Even governors are sanctioning and promoting. Look at that. That's California's governor, I believe, right? Is that um, Newsom? One of them. One of them. Universal basic income. And what is the context? July 5th, 2020. The pandemic of Matthew 24. Pestilences. Look at this. Pelosi, what is she also supporting? Guaranteed income. Look at this, my friends. There it is. A minimum guaranteed income may now be worthy of attention. Is a Sunday law on the horizon? Look at this. It says, headline, what is this? June 29, 2020. Look at this. The group, new mayors, plural, for guaranteed income. Income, governors, Congress, mayors. Look at this. Atlanta, Mayor Bottoms. What is she also supporting? Guaranteed income, my friends. Is a Sunday law near? It's nearer than many of us believe, my friends. Now, who would you expect now? To be also championing universal basic income for a Sunday law to be enforced. Talk to me now, my friends. The papacy. There it is. Watch carefully. Why Americans, New York Times, 2020, all these are recent. Why Americans need a guaranteed income and you don't have to work. It's against the Bible. Here it is. Pope Francis. 2020, calls for universal basic income. Is that not socialism? Is that not socialism? I'm telling you, my friends, while we focus, and we should, on the dual beasts of chapter 13 of Revelation, don't forget the third beast in Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9. And don't forget, beware of the trinity of beasts. Look at this, my friends. The Pope just proposed a universal basic wage. What does that mean for what country, my friends? The United States. It's against the Bible. The Bible says if a man does not work, he should, what, he should not what, my friends? Go to 2 Thessalonians with me. Where are we going to, my friends? 2 Thessalonians. And look with me, my friends. In 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, the Bible tells us in verse number 10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he what? Eat, for we hear. That there are some which walk among you disorderly. They do not want to work. Working, not at all, but are busy bodies. Verse number 12. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and what? Eat their own bread. Look at this, my friends. That's what I'm telling you. And we have individuals now who are saying, over here, who are saying, my friends, that we want to march against capitalism because capitalism is an oppressive form of government. That's part two. Not in this segment. I'm simply addressing socialism. 
But the irony is that socialism is also slavery. Socialism leads people to become pauperers to the government. Government dependent. So the same people that they say have propped up, have supported capitalism, overthrow capitalism. Let's demonstrate, let's march others, rioting, anarchy. We want socialism. Then who are going to be the ones to control your socialistic policies? The same men up top. It's government dependence. It's slavery. And the Bible says in Proverbs 22 and verse number 7 that the borrower is what? Servant to whom? The lender. Govern Go back to Genesis chapter 47. What happened down there in Egypt? When the people sold their land sold their bodies, and the government of Egypt controlled everything. That slavery by another name. A.T. Jones, listen to what he says. Socialism, he says, is impracticable. Again, he says, anarchy would bring only more abject, what's abject? More abject slavery. What two words does the, the historian use synonymously? Socialism and anarchy both will lead to abject slavery. Look at this, my friends. Do you know the squad from Congress? The squad, AOC, Alexandria, Ocasio-Cortez, and Ilhan Omar? What are they calling for? They are railing against Capitalism as a system of oppression used by the rich against the poor. Now, they may have an argument. They may debate that. But what is socialism? Even when they say we want democratic socialism, I'll get to that. It is still slavery by another name. Look at this, my friends. I'm going to come to an audio right away. Look at this, my friends. There it is. We want to tear down systems of oppression that exist in housing, education, health care, employment, even in the air we breathe. Climate change. Now, friends, here is uh, the male, not male, the men counterpart to the female, the woman squad from Congress. And one chief speaker, his name is Jamal Bowman. What is he calling for? Cancel rent. Listen. If people don't have jobs and they can't pay the rent, how are we going to hold them accountable by, by taking them to eviction? And in terms of the small landlords, we support, you know, a, a moratorium on uh, mortgages regarding small landlords because they, they are small and do, they do have their struggles. But we're talking about uh, larger real estate corporations and the real estate lobby that has been dictating how we do housing policy in New York State uh, for decades. We need a cancellation uh, of rent. We need a cancellation of small mortgages. We need a cancellation of utilities. We need to end uh, evictions. We need a blockade on, evic you know, on evictions as that runs out today in New York State and across the country. Uh, we need to invest in the people, uh, the working class people of our city, state, and country. It was very easy for us to write trillions of dollars, uh, write a $1.5 trillion check for Wall Street. Very easy for us to bail out the airline industry and, and, the, and the cruise industry. We need to bail out the working class people uh, of this country. And that's what the cancellation of rent is all about. Let's focus. Mm -hmm. hmm. Cancellation of rent. That's socialism. Cancellation of utilities. No electric bill. No water bill. No telephone bill. That's socialism. Where's that money coming from? In this uh, protocol, this project, this movement to cancel rent. All payments. All uh, expenses is coming from the federal government. So who is, an, who is in control? 
the federal government. It is big government under another name, regardless of how they try to spin their policies and to skew the nitty-gritty issues. Look at this. The same Jamal Bowman. Look at this. It says, uh, meet red box. Red, red box in the corner. Red column. Right column. Meet Jamal Bowman. The Bronx principal challenging one of the most powerful Democrats in Congress. Friends, he won. A black progressive, don't forget that word progressive, socialism. A black progressive beat a 16-term Democrat. Friends, do the math. How many years comprise one term? A 16-term Democrat in a heated New York congressional primary. The win by Jamal Bowman, all right, friends, is a signal victory for progressives or for socialism. The movement is here just as it was leading up to 1888. Let me say this, my friends. Don't you forget this. Socialism is Roman Catholic common good. Let's confirm that. Look at the screen right here, my friends. This is A.T. Jones. I gave you the first sentence. Socialism. Anarchy lead to abject slavery. Then he says blue words. He says uh, socialism. He says help can come alone from God, but it will not come by means of the so-called uh, common wheel. What is a common wheel? Common wheel is synonymous to common good. There it is, my friends. First things. A Roman Catholic page, April 2020. First sentence, one sentence. As Augustine writes in the city of God, the common good, also known as a common weal. Do you see it, my friends? And notice now, socialism is Roman Catholic common good. We just confirmed that. Do you know, friends, common good? You must give up your individual rights? Hold on. That sounds familiar. Socialism is giving up personal rights. Have you ever heard? Personal rights to property? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And the Pope told us, May 2019, common good has become global. Socialism. Are oh, you hearing this, my friends? He's telling us, the principles of socialism have become global. 1888, a Sunday bill was connected to socialism. Sunday, not on religious grounds, uh-uh, but on socialistic grounds. Is that point clear? Come back to the screen now. Watch. Common good It's not what, what is best. It's not what is best for me. But what is best for everyone? Give up your individual interest. That's common good, common weal. Then what is socialism? Here comes Uriah Smith. Uriah Smith says, socialism, blue words. Webster makes this word synonymous with communism, which he defines as follows. And he quotes, I won't spend much time there, red words in the middle. So, socialism, especially the doctrine of a community of property. Or the what, my friends? The negation of individual rights in property. So what does socialism do? It tramples underfoot your individual rights. What makes America great? Oh, I'm not quoting Trump, please. Let me give you a spirit of prophecy. What was the secret of America's prosperity? The two horns, religious liberty, civil free, uh, liberty, and those are found in the Declaration of Independence. Right, but what does socialism do? Can you see it, my friends? 
So what will break the two horns of America? Oh, Are you seeing this, my friends? Socialism is the matchmaker. What will break the two horns of religious and civil freedom in America? It is socialistic movement. Socialism. It's popery. It's the common good. The trinity of beasts. By the way, Uriah Smith says, blue words, these principles were carried into practice where? In France. The bees from the bottomless pit. And as the result, the revolution blossomed into all its horrid reality. Socialism in France in the time of the revolution, my friends. The trinity of bees, here's my point. Who would love to see the constitution of America overthrown? The papacy, we know that. Now, friends, since socialism, based on this quote, back to the screen, tramples on the foot individual rights in property, is that one of the amendments to the U.S. Constitution? Rights, rights of property, to own your own property? Then what would stop the policies and movement of socialism to trample on the first amendment of the U.S. Constitution? So what happens now? Watch carefully. If the socialistic movement say, we want Sunday rest to be the law of the land, what must happen to those who are Sabbath keepers? Socialism, common weal. Common weal, common good. What's common good? It's not what's best for me, but what is best for everyone. The majority in America, do they uphold Sunday or the Sabbath? Sunday. My friends, can we see what's coming? And now Satan has put a veneer over socialism. He has now called it, have you ever heard of Christian socialism? That sounds to me like baptized socialism. Baptized paganism. Socialism can never be Christian. Why? Come, 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 why? It tramp. Come, no, not just if you don't work, you don't eat. It overthrows biblical principles. That's true. Or what else? It tramples upon your individual rights. How could that be Christian? So how could Christians be a part of a socialist movement? They would be no different than Emperor Constantine of Rome. As a pagan, receiving baptism, but in thought and word and deed, still a pagan. Look at this, my friends. Watch. It says that Sunday come on God. Notice why these young, you see all these, all 2020, friends? All 2020? Why these young American Christians embrace what? Socialism. When American Christians were socialists, look at this. I, I was surprised when I saw this. Safe to serve international, those of you who are from Jamaica. Do you remember that there are two parties in, in Jamaica, political parties? Two political parties, the JLP, Jamaica Labor Party, the PNP, People's National Party party look at the screen red box red box it says uh, socialism is practical christianity written for the people's national party pnp of jamaica in 1965 who is that uh berthel Olman? pnp christian socialism that's an oxymoron, friends. Now, watch the point. When we see a movement upholding Christian socialism now, that is a great marker to show a son the law is near. Why do I say that? Leading up to 1888, history, leading up to 1888, the Sunday law bill, do you know what A.T. Jones wrote? He says, the Sunday law bill 
had connected to that movement uh, Christian socialism. Are you ready for it? Look at this. There it is. A.T. Jones, 1886. He says in this extract, it is clearly marked out the course which the Sunday cause will pursue. The religious sentiment and demand will be reinforced by whom? You see how we have been focusing on just the religious right in America? The Pat Roberts and the James Dobsons. Who else? The Sean Hannity. That's the political side, right? The Robert Jeffries, the Paula Whites, and the others. Unless we go back to history, you won't understand the role socialism is going to play. To usher in Sunday worship by law. I have a burden upon my heart, my friends. Get to the screen. And now you have a rising star. Not only Sean Hannity, but you have whom now? Tucker Carlson. Come to the screen. He says, the religious second sentence, Bluebird, the religious sentiment and demand will be reinforced by the non-religious, he says. Watch this. So-called Christianity. So-called Christianity will ally itself with socialism. Do you see it now? To get the support of the socialists in preserving the so-called Christian Sabbath. I wish I could have thrown Constantine account right here. Because the bishops of Rome told Constantine, if you end for Sunday in the empire, you will win the confidence of both churchmen and the pagans. And he did. Look at this now. Listen what A.T. Jones said next. And blue words. And by such shameful alliances as these, the wicked scheme of a national Sunday law will surely succeed. And persecution under it will surely follow. And to make the thing the more attractive to this element, the shamefully abused term, Christian, Christian is blended with the terrible title socialism. And so there is introduced to the world the new phrase, the new phrase, what my friends, Christian socialism. Then he says, which is just as congruous as is the phrase holy inquisition. Socialism can never be Christian, just as a papal inquisition can never be holy. So for a Sunday law to be enforced, look out for a Christian socialist movement. Christian socialist Sunday law. Does it make sense, my friends? Beware of the trinity of beasts. And look at this now, friends. There it is in bold relief. Democratic socialism is a what? A living political tradition. It's not biblical. It's the matchmaker. Democratic socialism against the Bible. Look at what we are told here, friends. Democratic socialism. A.T. Jones says, the real character of that which claims to be democracy. What's that word again, friends? Democracy may be tested by the principle of unselfishness. Socialism says what's yours is what? Mine. How could that be Christian? Can, because many will say, we don't want the socialism seen in Venezuela, seen in Cuba. No, we want Christian socialism. Is it making sense now? But it's an oxymoron. We don't want Venezuelan socialism. We want democratic socialism. But it's abject slavery. Does it make sense, my friends? 
as if the devil is not smarter than many people. He puts a veneer over it. It's called democratic socialism now. Christian socialism. It says it's baptized socialism, like baptized paganism. Socialism says what's yours is mine. But what says Christianity, my friends? On the other hand, Christianity says what's mine is what? Yours. There's a world of difference between the two sentiments. What is mine, I'm willing to share voluntarily. No. But socialism says civil leaders pass laws so we can force others to give me what they have. How could that be Christian? So how could Christians march with these socialists and then call themselves uh, Christians, even Seventh-day Adventists? No, you are Seventh-day pagans. Then E.J. Wagner chimes in, quoting Acts 2. Ver Go to Acts 2 with me. You must see this, my friends. Go to Acts chapter 2. In verse number 42, verse 44, verse 45 are the scriptures the so-called socialists use to champion socialism. They say, well, it's Christian because Acts 2, 44, verse 45, all the things they had, they gave to others. That's Christian socialism. That's what they say. And then they quote Acts 4. Verse 32 through verse 34, all they had, they shared with others. So no man lacked anything. Then they say, that's Christian socialism, friends. When Satan approached Eve in the Garden of Eden, did Satan quote the words of God? Yes, he did. But what he did? He misconstrued the words of God. What now? Twisted it, skewed it. When Satan approached Christ in the wilderness of temptation, did he quote the Bible from Psalm 91? Oh, yes, he quoted Psalm 91. What happened? He misconstrued the words of God. So what is Christian socialism? It is misconstruing the Bible, my friends. Does it make sense now? Come to the screen. He says, modern socialism aims at an equal distribution of property, but it is radically defective and can never succeed. He's clear on that. Its principles, while they seem to many to be Christian, are directly opposed to Christianity. Blue words, the Christian way is for each one to say that what he has does not belong to him but is given to him in trust to help others. Watch this now. Watch carefully. The human way is for each one to say, the socialist now, the human way is for each one to say that he has a right to what belongs to somebody else and that the world owes him a living that socialistic thinking. Government must pay my electric bill and I shouldn't have to work or work as hard. Government must pay my, you get the point, my rent, my mortgage. The world owes me a living. By the way, I come to this church. I see all the money you're collecting in the offering plate. You know what? What you have should be given to me to pay my rent. You have Christians, so so-called Christians, who are socialists in thinking. They go to a church and they're very indolent. They are not the Lord's poor. But they want to use guilt trip, their trickeries, <laughs> to cause church leaders, church officers, to deal uh, money to them to take care of their expenses while they just relax and be at ease in Zion. They're not Christians. 
They are pagans. Now that phrase, the world owes me a living, E.J. Wagner says it's modern spiritualism. It's modern socialism. It is so-called Christian socialism. Sister White used the very same words. Look at this. She says, watch carefully, red words at the bottom. The proverb, the world owes me a living, has in it the essence of falsehood, fraud, and robbery, she says. Oh, yes. So many profess SDA, they are robbers, deceivers, breaking God's commandments. The church owes me a living. Where did you get that from, my brother, my sister? That's socialism. She says, if a poor man comes to your house and he's hungry, it says help him. She says, we may give to the poor and harm them by teaching them to be how? To be dependent. Such giving encourages selfishness and helplessness. The world owes no man a living who is able to work and gain a living for himself. She says real charity is not just to give people money, friends. It's to sit with them and show them how they can help themselves and then in turn help others. That's what that statement is saying. And then she goes on to say, she says, watch carefully, Show those who have nothing that Bible religion never makes men idlers, red words. Even Christ says, I must work, not sit idly. I must work. Beloved, before we can do this, by the way, Sister White says, don't wait on the government to help the church. So where can I find solution, pastor? Don't look to the government to help the church, the Lord's poor. What is the solution? It is God's will that the Lord's fortunate, the Lord's rich, be united with the Lord's poor, not the government. Capitalism is not the answer. Even though I spend all the time addressing socialism. So what's the answer? Capitalism? No, it's not, friends. Not for the church. Look at this, my friends. It says, watch carefully. Blue words. It is God's purpose that the rich and the poor shall be closely bound together by what ties? The ties of sympathy. The ties of helpfulness. That's it, my friends. The Lord's rich with the Lord's poor. It's time to help others. Go back to Acts chapter 2 with me. Uh, thank you, brother. STS Connect that we just launched on our website, prophesyagain.org. That's why, my friends... <laughs> God showed us the crisis. He also shows us the solution. Amen, my friends, to that. Amen. But before we can help those who have not, we have to be converted. The primary thing that men need is not clothes. Mm -mm. It's not food. It's spiritual nourishment, Bible conversion. And while we look at Acts 2, verse 44 and verse 45, where what they had, they shared. Acts 4, verse 32 through verse 35, what they had, they shared, and God rooted out Ananias. The next one, Sapphira. Why? They were selfish. Amen to that. Before they could do that, what experience did they have in the upper room? They were on one accord, in one place, where they converted, my friends. 
And what did they receive on the day of Pentecost? They received the approving of the Pentecostal power, the approving of the Holy Spirit of God. So before we talk about uniting the Lord's rich with the Lord's poor, before we emphasize helping the poor and needy, the Lord's poor, we must make sure we are having an upper room experience getting victory over sin to receive the former and the latter rain. That's it, my friends. We must become converted, by the way, for them to come in one accord, for them to be on one accord. What did they have to lay aside, friends? What did they have to lay aside among themselves, between themselves, differences, sins, unforgiveness, malice, the strife for supremacy. My platform has more views than yours. I command more attention than yours. My church has more members than yours. Let's flip it. Next tier, next level. I have a higher paying job than you have. Look at my family. Look at yours. Heart conversion is what is needed. No longer who shall be the greatest. This must be my experience. And today I see my need. This must be your experience. Do you see your need? Hold on, friends. Do you see your need? As they receive, I'll give it to you now. As they receive. The outpouring of the Spirit of God and had to be converted first. If we are going to receive the outpouring of the Spirit of God, lateral power, the repetition of Pentecost, we have to also be converted. Volume 5, Testimonies for the Church. Page 214, it says, not one of us can expect. Now one of us will receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot of stain of sin upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defect of our characters and to cleanse the soul temple. To cleanse, again, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement then the latter rain then the latter rain will fall upon us as as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of pentecost mark that friends volume 5 page 214 uh, this morning as i was thinking about that the quote that came to my mind is since our greatest need is to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, why do we not study concerning how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Why do we not talk about receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Why do we not pray in order to receive the outpouring? Of the Holy Spirit. Let me read that for you. Watch this. Here it is. Acts of the Apostles. Page 50 says. Since this is the means. By which we are to receive power. Midday power surge on this Sabbath. July 11th. 2020. Since this is the means by which we are to receive power. Why do we not hunger? And thirst for the gift of the Spirit. Friends, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty for this. How about you? Read on. Why do we not talk of it? That's what we shall do. Why do we not pray for it? That's what we shall do now as I close. Why do we not preach concerning it? 
pause right there now. Watch the connection with receiving the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Watch the connection with the trinity of beasts that we must be aware of, especially the beasts from the abyss, the bottomless pit, so-called democratic socialism, so-called Christian socialism. Listen, when that was connected to the Sunday Bill in 1888, so-called socialism with the Sunday Law Bill in 1888, what message did God give to Ellen White to live and to write about and preach? What message did God give to A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner to write about, preach about, to experience what, my friends? <laughs> Come on. Justification by faith. The righteousness of Jesus Christ to be received by faith. And to receive what, friends? The outpouring of the latterine. So now we are seeing the repetition of the trinity of beasts. Now in 2020, what message must we talk about? Come to the screen. What must we pray about? What must we preach about, my friends? The outpouring, the reception of the Spirit of God. It says the Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who serve him. Then parents are to give good gifts to their children. Last sentence. For the daily, is today a day? For the daily, for the Sabbath baptism, we can say now. Doublet special. For the, doublet special. Richard, doublet special. Now you know my past back in Jamaica now, right? For the daily baptism. Of the Spirit, for the Sabbath baptism of the Holy Spirit. How many workers? Every worker should offer his petition to God. And friends, what words in blue are underlined there? I'm going to close now. I'm not going to give you mere theory. How can I give you a practical way to receive the outpouring of the Spirit of God? It says, Come back to the screen, preacher, Brother Paul. Don't only talk of it, elder, it says, but we must pray for it. Do you know what I did? I took my Bible concordance, the, the exhaustive. I looked up the word spirit. Friends, do you know how many times the word spirit singular is used in the whole Bible? Over 400 and 50 times I went through every single hit, every single verse. I'm looking for a verse that says a prayer because I want to make that scripture my prayer. Do likewise, friends. If you see a verse that talks about God's promise with the Spirit, claim that promise this is how you experience Bible religion in a practical sense. If in that scripture you find people in the scene, put yourself in their place. Let me give you an example now. The primary person that came to my mind about somebody praying for the Holy Spirit, praying for the Spirit. May I ask you a question? Who, who comes to your mind? Let me see if the Spirit of God is working. Who comes to your mind? Who prayed for the Spirit of God and received it? With confession, with repentance, who comes to your mind? You're going to talk to me? Who now? You want to talk to me? You feel yours might not be mine? Friends, this is not socialism, amen? You can have your own. Come on, talk. David, amen. Go to Psalm 51 with me, my friends. Where are we going to? Psalm 51. That wasn't yours? That wasn't yours? That wasn't yours? Psalm 51. Look with me at verse number one. 
I want everyone now to focus as we have devotion today. It says in verse number one of Psalm 51, Father, as we read these words, may we analyze, may we examine ourselves, may we truly have devotion today in the name of Jesus Christ. Baptize us with thy Holy Spirit for Christ's sake. Amen. Verse one, have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Friends, when you're eating the word, the bread, chew slowly. Emphasize every word. Say, Lord, what are you saying here? Look at verse number one. What words are used repetitively in verse number one? What words? What words? Do you see mercy being used twice? Do you see loving kindness there also? When David began this prayer, David saw his need. Do we see your need? This was when Nathan came to him. And the scene. Implication was, if David did not surrender at this point, David would have grieved the Holy Spirit and would have been cut off. How do I know? He said, cast me not away from thy presence. Blot out my sins. Don't blot me out. Do I see my need today? Do you see your need today? We must all now say, Lord, I see my need. Number two, when David prayed this prayer, David began by praying, by exalting and reminding himself of God's character. Have mercy. You are loving. You are kind. Hold on there. What comes to your mind? What came to my mind? Exodus 33 and Exodus chapter 34. Lord, show me your glory. Show me your character. And what did God show Moses in the 34th chapter of Exodus? Verse 4 and verse 5, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and in truth, keeping mer Oh, my friends, Sir David was clinging to the character of God. You are merciful. You are loving. To that I cling. Have mercy, dear God. That's how we are to pray. The second thing in verse 2. Blot out my transgressions. And this says to me, David understood the sanctuary. Did he not want to build a sanctuary? Yes, but Solomon built the literal sanctuary. He understood it because they understood the experience of Moses. Blot out, where's blotting out coming from? It's the most holy place. David did not pray, Lord, simply forgive me, no. Don't forgive and leave my sin covered in the books. No, I'm looking for the day when my sins will be what? Erased, blotted out. And I remain in the Lamb's book of life. This must be our prayer. Blot out my transgressions. And friends, speaking about the Holy Spirit... Acts chapter 3 came to my mind. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 which says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your, finish it with me, that your sins may be blotted out. So what was David praying for? Repentance, power to turn from sin and never to go back to sin. Power to remain converted. Yes, my friends. So what must be our prayer? What must be your prayer right now? Pray for it. Look at this now. Verse number, the third point, verse two. He says, wash me. So let's read now. Look, 
Lord, wash me truly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Acknowledge means to confess. Lord, you said, what was David praying? I acknowledge. So when we come to God, we must confess every sin and we must be specific. Specific. Don't just pray, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Those words are reserved for public prayer. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Amen. Uh -uh. But for closet prayers, individual prayers, personal prayers, we have to be specific. That's why I point you again to this book called Steps to Christ, the chapter entitled Confession. Be specific. Look at this now. What sins do you want to confess specifically to God? Verse 4, against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil. In what? In your sight. Hold on there, friends. Did David sin against God? So I put myself in this place. What did David do? The Bible says that David, come on, what did David do, my friends? What did David, I mean, why did Nathan go to him? Oh, okay, come on now. What did David do? Hmm. Did he not lie, deceive with his general? Did he not kill, murder Uriah and then take his wife? That's stealing. That's covetousness. How many sins he broke right there? And then committed adultery. Then he says, Lord, against thee, against thee only have I sinned. He's not saying the family members weren't grieving. But he understood to hurt one is to hurt God. I want husbands to understand this. If when you hurt your wife, you're hurting God. And vice versa, when you hurt your brethren, your brother, you're hurting God. When you hurt your sister, you are hurting God. Then David did something very practical. Lord, I acknowledge this sin in your sight. Friends, I have found when I have a sin I'm struggling with and I bring that sin into prayer and I'm very specific with that sin, in my mind and scripture, I retrace Christ's steps from Gethsemane to the cross. And I said, Lord, this sin, double plate, Richard, double plate now, this sin of reggae music, this sin of dance hall that I so loved, Lord, this sin is the sin that crucified you. This sin is the sin that caused you to weep in agony in Gethsemane. This is the sin that slapped you. This is the sin that spat on you. This is the sin that whipped you. This is the sin that caused you on Calvary to say, My God, my God, why hast thou? forsaken me you took that for me lord i do not want to be separated from thee because of this sin today i'm asking you now blot out this transgression blot it out from where from my mind so i will no longer desire Bring that sin to Gethsemane. That's the point in a nutshell. Bring that sin to Calvary and replay those scenes in your mind if you know them. Go to Mark 13 onward. Go to Luke 23 onward. Go to Matthew 26 onward. Go to John chapter 13 onward. Replay the scenes and you watch what God would do for you. Fourthly, David said, now, Lord, there's no excuse for sin. 
and I can get victory over sin. This is what we must believe and this is what we must pray. Listen to what he writes and says. Verse number five, behold. What does behold mean? To me, it means look. So he's saying, Lord, look, Lord, look. I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. As if he's going to give an excuse for his sin. Lord, I was born with a sinful nature. But look at verse number six. Look, behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, the inner man. Even though I was born with a sinful nature, you still, des you, you still desire for me. Your desire for me is to do what is right in your sight. And today, God, I bring no excuse. All I'm saying, have mercy, pardon, and give me a victory over sin. So now he prays, purge me now with his up. And I, you see, friends, no excuse. And if, 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 if spouses would understand this, Five minutes would solve your marriage problems. It's because you're trying to justify yourselves in sin. If pride didn't plan for this, if pride and selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would solve the marriage problems. Angels are grieved. God displeased by the hours spent in justifying self Early writings, page 119. Book it, my friends. Come back. Make me to all. Oh, verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be what? Do you know what he was quoting here? David is very knowledgeable of Scripture. He's quoting the principles of Isaiah chapter 1. Come now, verse 18, verse 19. Come now. Therefore, says, said the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, I shall be made them white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, I shall be, they shall be made as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Will you come? Then verse 80 says, make me to hear. Joy and gladness. What? What is he quoting here, friends? How would I hear joy and gladness? Once you pray and you surrender, then, friends, listen out for joy to come to your heart. Expect gladness. What came to my mind was this. In Luke chapter 15, when the sheep is brought back to the fold, when the lost coin is found, when the prodigal comes to his senses and returns, the Bible says, heaven does what? Rejoice over how many? Over one sinner that sees his need and repent. Make me to hear what joy Jesus is now saying. My son, Andrew, you now make me happy. Every day we can hear that, friends. Now, we may not hear it audibly, but we can read the promises just above a whisper, and then we will hear it. Here it is now. He prays for the Spirit of God. Verse 9. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Come on, let's read verse 10 now. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And what now? And renew a right, what friends, a right spirit within me. That is where David now, preacher, elder, Powell, back to the screen, blue words, underline, pray for it. This is where David now actually prayed for the spirit of God. He says what? Renew. He says what now, friends? He says, and renew a right spirit within me. This is a potent point. Don't miss it. 
after he surrendered and he prayed for the spirit to be renewed, do you know what text came to my mind? Ezekiel. What, my sister? Ezekiel 36, verse 26, onward, where Jesus says, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to do what now? To walk in my statutes and do them. So what is the purpose of receiving the spirit of God now once you surrender to go and sin? Finish it to go and sin no more. That's it, my friends. Justification, you surrender. Now comes uh, sanctification on into glorification, friends. Powerful. Watch this now. Verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence. Not me, but cast my sins away. Amen. Cast me, that means David understood the books in heaven. What three books are up there? The book of sin, the book of remembrance, the book of life. He understood them, my friends. Come on now. Cast me not away from thy presence. Friends, we must say that today. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, restore unto me now the joy of thy salvation. And what now? Uphold me with thy free spirit. When it says in verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence. What is in God's presence? Anybody? You must read every phrase. Why would he not want to leave God's presence? What is in God's presence? Come on, what text comes to your mind? Ah, Psalm 16, verse 11. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there's what? Pleasures. How long? Forevermore. What else is in his presence? Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent you therefore. Be converted. That your sins may be what? Blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come, where is the refreshing coming from? From the presence of the Lord. And what is that refreshing? Come on, friends. It is the latter rain power. Early writings, page 71. It's the latter rain, my friends. Oh, my friends. This is the prayer to receive the latter rain. 1888 experience renewed. Then verse 13. I'm, I'm finished now, friends. I'm going to scan and pray. I'm finished now. We had devotion. For, come on, Elder Paul. For the daily baptism of the Spirit. We can now say, for the Sabbath baptism, let's pray for it. Friends, I got it. I believe I have it. How about you, my friends? Now, once we have it, what must we do now? Keep it to ourselves. What is in verse 13 now? Then will I teach transgressors now. Husbands, teach your wife now. Parents, mothers, teach your children now. Brother, teach brother. Sister, teach sister. Let's close. Let's close. Verse 17, I close. He says, when David finished praying, we are told that David did not feel the way he began when he began praying. He was lifted up in joy. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, finish it. Thou wilt not despise. How did David feel afterwards? Separated or reunited with God? Which one? How can we leave this Sabbath service, friends? The choice is yours. Separated from him 
or reunited with him. How do I want to leave? How do you want to leave, my brother? My sister. Save to serve international. How do you want to leave? A wonderful quote is in Ministry of Healing, page 182, which says, God forgives all of his people. Those whom God has forgiven the most love him the most. And at the last end, they will stand the nearest to his throne. Those whom God has forgiven most, friends, love him how? How much do I love him? How much do you love him? And in the latter end, at the second coming of Christ, when we go home, who will stand the nearest? Who will stand the closest? Those whom God has forgiven most. That means if you have sinned the most, don't think you have been cut off. Just experience Psalm 51 daily and you will stand the closest. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath experience. Save us, we pray. We surrender all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.